miles in every direction. Um, it, to make the ascent requires 7,000 feet of toil, and the summit is at 14,000 feet, which is considered right into the starting of high altitude, so there will be a bit less oxygen, well, a lot less oxygen at that altitude. You need to plan at least three days to do this, and some money and time. <laughs> So here's some fun facts about the mountain, which are cool to go through. So at one point in 1959, it had the deepest single storm recorded snowfall in history. So that means that in one storm, there was about 16 feet of snow that fell in the mountain. Wow. Um, 8,000 climbing permits are issued every year, which is a large number. But even though it's not a particularly challenging mountain, only about half of the people that get those permits actually reach the top. And some of them die. Um, nearly 50 have died on Shasta since 1916. Um, and here's one thing that you might be sad to hear. When you do stand on that summit and you see 100 miles in every direction, you actually cannot see the ocean, I'm sorry. Okay? Because because <laughs> the curvature of the Earth, it's actually impossible to do so. <laughs> so it was not, in fact, sighted from... The Pacific by the first explorers. That was it. That was something that, yeah, that was something they did not see it. But there are, there's more than just a big hunk of rock up there. So it's got five glaciers that ring this mountain, and um, all of them are growing, which is really surprising. And the reason for that is because of the particular weather patterns in this part of the world, as global warming increases, it actually creates a stronger and stronger stream of moisture across the north side of Shasta. Those glaciers that are there now have been there in the past, but they weren't there 600 years ago. It was dry on that side of the mountain. Mm -hmm. So in the last 600 years, they've, they've grown and come back, and they're, they're growing still. Although they might be slowing down a little. Um, it is a stratovolcano. It's the youngest, which means that there's four different mountains that have over time erupted to create this one big guy. And it erupts every 250 to 300 years. Last known eruption, 200 years ago. So, <laughs> better get up there quick. <laughs> um, some cool stuff about the history of the mountain, as you can read along with me. Um, 1854 was the first time it was ascended, which was not that long ago in terms of uh, mountain ascents in our country. Um, in 1856, only two years afterwards, though, Harrietta Eddy climbed it, which is pretty awesome for that being that early. Um, John Muir is one of the most famous people to climb it, and he survived in a stormy night on the summit by um, being in the sulfur vent itself in the mud there. So I guess he smelled really great after he got back after that. Um, John Wesley Powell, who's the one-armed Civil War veteran that, that explored the Grand Canyon, also <laughs> climbed it and named the glaciers. And uh, the record climbs, 1985, which might still stand on Avalanche College, one hour and 39 minutes from Bunny Flat. Running with spiked shoes, I'm sure, um, on a very firm surface. No, and in 2002, <laughs> 2002 um, paraplegic climbers, this is really cool, hand cranked these custom snow pods at the summit. So they had um, some sort of <coughs> mechanism so it could kind of crawl its way up. I thought that was fun to learn huh. about. So some other cool stuff about the mountain that is more or less interesting. Um, there was a, a novel that purported the existence of a mystic temple inside Shasta. And, oh, and before yeah. and since then, there's been a lot of um, speculation about secret societies and people who live inside the mountain, the Lemurians, and being part of an ancient civilization, Excellent. UFO sightings, spiritual vortexes, crystal worshippers, and all kinds of other things. So it's a very colorful place. And then they go there. <laughs> All right, let's head on to the next one. Back down to earth, some really uh, on the ground regulations you're gonna need to know about. One is that you need to summit pass if you decide to go above or wish to go or try to go above 10,000 feet. And that costs $25 per person or you can get it for $30 a year for the annual. Um, anytime you camp a mountain, you need a wilderness permit, which can be self-issue at all of the trailheads, it's free. But you also need to make sure that you pack out all solid waste. So that's a new that's a new twist. Some of you that might be new to you. That's something that happens in mountaineering in places where there's no chance of decomposition of human waste. So that needs to be packed. Let's ask ourselves, what does it take to get up this mountain? There's a lot of routes on there. 
and many of them involve climbing, all of them involve climbing snow and some involve climbing ice up to about 60 degrees. <laughs> Most involve camping on or in the snow, some off trail. There is no trail to the top, so everything is really off trail. You need to know your way and understand how to get to the top and back safely. You need to have a little bit of understanding about weather and systems and what happens at altitude. Because of its prominence, the mountain actually creates its own weather. So you can get a forecast, like this last weekend, we had a forecast 70% chance of snow, little to no snow accumulation expected. That night, we got 14 inches all the way down beyond the trailhead. So, you know. <laughs> Glacier climbing and rescue on some routes is also necessary. All right. Any questions along the way, let me know. I'm just going to keep rolling through here. So let's talk about the other things that you're going to need to climb, and one of them is taking care of the engine to get you up there, which is you. Um, summiting is, is not very possible if you don't train for it. So to do that, what I'd recommend is many weeks before you decide to go to Shasta, possibly up to three months in advance, I would say you need to be working out. Cardiovascular endurance is important. Um, your legs will have to propel you and your pack up 7,000 feet over the course of 48 hours. So it's important to run, bike, swim for an hour, three times a week. And just remember that even though you may have to go up 7,000 <coughs> feet, you also have to deal with the fact that at the t near the top, you're going to have less oxygen and be more tired than you will at the bottom. So it's not just having the muscle to get up there, but also having the lung power to deal with decreased ability to breathe oxygen decreased ability to, to assimilate oxygen because there's just simply less there. It'll get tough, the last thousand feet. There's a feature on, Rain, on not Rainier, but Shasta called Misery Hill. I'll show you where that is. It's the last thousand feet. <laughs> let's go on to the next one. So topographically, let's take a little overview of the mountain. This, of course, is north. And as you drive up on I-5, you're going to come by this way if you're coming from the south. One of the... <laughs> First things you're going to see is um, Cassaval Ridge, which is here, and Avalanche Gulch. And notice that this whole side of the mountain does not have glaciers on it. So it will have snow on it most of the year, but not glaciers. So make sure that you, when you climb south-facing routes, that you're there during a period of time when there's snow on the mountain, because it's safer and more fun to climb it with snow rather than lots of loose volcanic rubble. Um, as you go around the mountain, from the south, we swing to the west. You go to a subsummit called Shastina, which is 12,000 feet, one of the former cones of Shasta. And then the Whitney Glacier, Volan Glacier, the Hotland Glacier, the Winton Glacier, the Kawakatan Glacier, Green Butte, and various other ridges, and back to Avalanche Gulch. So, well, I don't remember if that's the way we're going to progress, but I'll take you all the way around the mountain and we'll talk about the routes. And we'll, I think we're going to look at the other, all the sides of the mountain in brief here. What's the next slide? Okay, yeah, we are. Okay, so the southwest side, Bunny Flat, which is a paved road that's accessible most of the year, will take you up here to around 7,000 feet, and from there you can climb the most popular route, which is Avalanche Gulch. It's on the south side, aptly named a gulch that does avalanche, okay? Um, so you'll be in kind of a, a, a canyon, in a sense. Um, Helen Lake is the camp here at 10,000. And then you go up to the Red Banks, Misery Hill, and then to the summit. <coughs> Moving around from there, we've got Cassaval Ridge, the West Face, Cascade Gulch, um, Green Butte, Sergeant's Ridge, and I'm not really sure what that one is over there. I don't remember. Maybe Clear Creek. Um, and all of these little red dots are places that people normally camp, red triangles. So this is courtesy of the Mount Shasta Avalanche website. <laughs> bottom red triangle where there's a historic Sierra Club hut and some purportedly great springs of water there but I've never seen them because they've always been covered by snow mm -hmm. but it's, it's a nice place to camp if you don't want to go all the way to 10 from the 7,000 foot trailhead yeah, on the Atlantic Coast. Yeah, it's a little faucet there. I mean, you just open up the Yeah, faucet. so it does exist, huh? Yeah, okay. and uh, cool. it has a solar quarter johns, two what? solar quarter johns. Yeah. That's too much. All right. <laughs> Well, it sounds like it's a nice place to go, but you're only about 800 feet higher than the trailhead, so you got to keep trucking. All right, what's next? Okay, so Avalanche Gulch itself. Here's the stats. You start at 7. You go up 7,200 feet to the top. Your camps are, of course, camp. Most people go to Helen Lake, which is right here, or Lake Helen. 
And then it takes about average of eight hours for the average person to climb from Helen Lake to the summit and back. And the best time is about about from now till around July, when the snow is firm and the days are long, the weather is pretty decent. After that, or before that, it's either too cold or too melted out, or too snowy. So Bunny Flat to Helen Lake is the first stage of your ascent. When you park the car, you need to get your wilderness permit, make sure you got your summit pass and got your waste bags, and then get an early start so you can get up to camp and get your spot amongst the other 100 people that are going to be there on a weekend, or go on a weekday so you don't have to deal with big crowds. There actually is a ranger staffed camp there, a guy or a gal who's there, a ranger will be there um, during those periods of time uh, from May to July. The next day, you're going to want to go from Helen Lake up to halfway up the route, which is Red Banks, which is right about there. And that's the major portion of the route that's got a lot of people on it. You do that in the morning, well, excuse me, before the morning. You do it in the, the latter end of the night before dawn, usually. As you see a bunch of headlamps like ants going up the hill. It'll be icy and it'll be slick, so you have to make sure you've got your crampon scales down at that point. And then from there, let's go on to the next one. You go up to Misery Hill, and that tops you out on inside the crater. And one part of the crater is this high summit <coughs> castle. So it's one of the best one of the best summits ever. This is the actual summit right there. The summit itself is about the size of this table. Um, so you can only about five or six people can fit there on the top, and it drops off. And some sides vary a lot, and some sides not so much, but it drops off on all sides. So it's a pretty spectacular top. Really great mountain. Let's go on to the next one. Here's a picture of it. This is the actual summit right there on a very clear day, probably in July. Green never made it. Next, here's some other photos of various celebrations <laughs> and happenings that go on at the top of the, the, the convergence of all sorts of festivities. <laughs> so there's many ways to get there as we move, I guess we'd talk about some other routes. So the first one we come to is Sergeant's Ridge and Green Butte, which are two ends of a ridge that converge and then <coughs> catch up with the route at, um, at, at Thumb Rock or Red Banks, just above Red Banks. So they're a little tougher. Um, they're a little more difficult in route finding, but there's some great rock scrambling and some wonderful snow and ice to be had there. Let's go on. <coughs> Here's some pictures courtesy of Summit Post, um, possible lines. You can see the complexity of winters. So um, make sure that you get some great information like this or some fairly descriptive route descriptions so that you don't have to go through the, um, the problem of finding your way through the pinnacles. What's next? Next slide. Okay, so moving to the other side of those routes would be Cassaval Ridge, and that's a favorite for us and for winter climbing. Between March and May is a good time to climb it. What's nice about that one is it's south-facing and has these <coughs> pretty cool towers. So um, it doesn't have snow most of the year, but what snow does get on it will consolidate fairly quickly. and when it has snow, it's the only time you're able to get through this one little gap called the catwalk. And this drops off pretty pretty quickly here, and this is a cliff. So there's only this one little narrow sidewalk, and that's why it's a winter route, because later on in the year, that is all melted away, and so it's kind of dangerous scree with no protection. Um, the... Um, combination of Abbey Gulch or maybe Sergeant's Ridge is a good reason to use that route. And then another one that's coming up would be um, West Base. So let's go on to the next one. So here's our overview. Avalanche Gulch, Helen Lake, Red Banks, Thumb Rock, Misery Hill, Summit. This is Green Butte, I believe. And this is Sergeant's, and they come together to form Sergeant's. This is Cassaval Ridge here. And this is the west base. Cascade Gulch and Chestina. 
So next time you drive up I-5 and you're looking at it, you see this nice long spiny ridge, you'll say, oh, that's Casaball Ridge. And you can pick out all the other routes. So just on that one side, there's a whole bunch of great routes. Let's go on to the next one. The West Face and Cascade Gulch routes. Um, this is Casaball Ridge. This is Cascade, excuse me, this is West Face, and the Cascade Gulch start is over here. So this is a nice route as a descent off of the uh, Casaball Ridge route. And it's quite a bit like Avalanche Gulch, just much less traveled. So it's a possibly better choice. Just doesn't have a lot of folks. Same sort of climbing, though. Okay, let's head on to the next one. <coughs> oh, like I said, so that's that's an alternative place for you to go if you want to have an, uh, an easy mountaineering experience like Avalanche Gulch, but don't really care for having so many people there. One cool thing about Cascade Gulch in particular is it actually takes you up to Shastina, which you won't see a lot of people there. So it's the 12,000-foot sister mountain to Shasta. And up there, there's a couple sinkhole lakes and an active crater, too. And after you get up to that, that, that spot, you can actually drop down, if you wish, onto the Whitney Glacier and climb that up, too. So it's quite, quite scenic with lots of um, interesting topography to see. All right, let's move on to my favorite side, which is the north side. So we came around this edge, so that would be Cascade Gulch coming up from the south, and now we're on the north side. There really isn't, we did kind of south and west just then. Understanding what they are, Cascade Gulch comes to the pass right here. This one is the Whitney Glacier. This is the Whitney Bolum route. This is the Bolum. This would be the Hotlum Bolum Ridge. This would be the Hotlum Glacier, and that would be the Winton Glacier. <coughs> And, well, actually, that would be the Hotlum Winton Ridge, actually. The Winton Glacier would be around the corner. So this is probably more interesting to mountaineers because it's steeper, it's a little more remote, and, of course, it has the glaciers there, which present some ice climbing, some crevasses to work with, and a little more wilderness experience. So let's, let's go on. So, again, outlined in red are the various glaciers. Um, the Hotlum is the steepest and the most crevassed, so that's why we like to go there a lot. We have our crevasse rescue training there, like we tried to do this weekend. Whether um, we pass quite a few years. Um, the Bolum is another one that has a few crevasses, and the Whitney is kind of out of the picture here, but it's actually the longest glacier in California. Um, this one is the most crevassed. And then the Winton is... Um, kind of a homely cousin to the others. It doesn't have any real crevasses, so it's not so exciting, but it's an awesome place to ski. So, all right, what's next? All right, so let's look at the Whitney Glacier. What's cool about that one is it's really long, and it's got some pretty beautiful formations on it, as you can see here. Um, it isn't particularly steep, but it is a real um, glacier, so it requires crevasse rescue and glacier travel skills. And it does have an active Serac area where a bunch of crevasses are crossing and creating these standing blocks of ice that fall. That's what a Serac is. And um, one thing to know about it, from personal experience, I can tell you that all the trailheads to get to Whitney are difficult. So you have to pay your dues to get to that side of the mountain. But you will find that you'll be alone on that glacier, probably. Next to it is probably the first one that a lot of folks on Shasta who climb, they want to have some experience with glacier travel. It's really only got two major um, features. There, there's two Bergs runs, a lower one and a higher one, and they're they're pretty easy to find. That's pretty much the only hazards, and it's fairly accessible from the Northgate Trailhead. Let's go on to the next. So this would be essentially from Marine Camp, which is the camp we like to use at 10,700 feet on the north side, accessible from Marine Camp, accessible from Northgate. This is the Bolum Gully, Bolum Gully route the crevasses you can see are off to the side here. This is the ridge between it and the Whitney Glacier. The Bergschrund, which is probably one of the biggest ever in California, is very broad and close up to the ridge here. So that'd be a good spot because it's so easy to find and so big it'd be a good spot to go check it out. Go lower down inside that thing. All right, what's next? So one of my favorite routes and the one that um, I was actually able to climb this weekend and is comparable to Avalanche Gulch in terms of not requiring ropes, 
but is more of a wilderness experience is the Hotland Bolum Ridge route. And here's some of the reasons why um, I'd recommend this route. For one, it's direct. So it stays on a ridge between two beautiful glaciers. So it's fairly easy route finding. Um, that helps both on the way up and the way down. Um, it is exposed climbing, but not something that's crazy or, um, or really uh, rife with danger if you were to slip. Okay. However, it's, uh, as it threads this high line between the glaciers, it's very scenic. So unlike being stuck in a hole like you are in Avalanche Gulch, you're actually up to views all the way up. It's got some really interesting features like these. These are the cat's ears. They're these two towers at about 13.5. They're about 50 to 70 feet tall, just sticking up there. Um, it also goes by the fumaroles. Um, so there's lots of rime ice because that side of the mountain gets coated with wind all the time. So you actually see formations of rime ice like cauliflowers on top of each other, forming rime ice caves on that side. Um, it goes by the shark's fin, which is another pretty interesting rock shaped like, well, a shark's fin on that side, and um, you get a, you get a chance to get a pretty experience, pretty amazing experience. So set up. I'm going to talk about that one a little bit more. So this would be the Hotland Glacier again with all of the crevasses, but a lot of people go through the avenue right here up to the balcony about 13, and then they go up another 500 feet to the Cat's Ears, go around on the sidewalk to look down the Bolin Glacier, over to the shark's fin check out the fumaroles, and then climb the rime ice to the summit ridge and come in from the other side. So you'll be on the, you'll be coming down the ridge and you'll see people on the summit and they'll be like, where are those guys coming from? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go on to the next one. So here's a more typical way to ascend. You come up the dragon spine from 10, 7 or so. This, this is a lot further than it looks. This is 13,000 right here. And then most people, I would suspect, would go up to the cat's ears of the sidewalk and over around the corner. But you can also drop on the upper portions of the Bolum Glacier and head up from there. Either way, you're going to be able to look <laughs> down on the Bolum and the Hotlum, especially if you walk out right out here to the edge. You'll be able to look at the Hotlum head wall and all three ice falls of the Hotlum Glacier without having to actually be on them. So it's the best view of that magnificent feature. Let's head on to the next one. So just another view of um, various landmarks along the way. You can camp anywhere from 9,000 to 10. That gives you a good start, so you'd only have to go around five to 4,000 feet up the route from cones and go through a pretty unique white bark pine forest. So it's a pretty awesome route. Okay, let's head on to the next one. So how to do that? Um, First off, drive five hours north to Weed, California. Go, this is not right. It's actually more like eight miles of dirt roads because they changed the route since I built this presentation. Um, but Northgate is also, <laughs> that's wrong too. It's about 7,000 feet. I was just there this last weekend, so I'm looking at my stuff. So, yeah, that's, that's a little off. Um, but this is true. You, you hike about four miles, which doesn't seem like very long, but Marine Camp is pretty high. It's actually a 10-7. So it's, it's up there. <clears throat> Let's go on to the next one. Um, at that camp, you probably have to melt snow, and you may be exposed to wind, but one of the reasons why it's a nice camp is because it's, it's uh, on a place where there's a bunch of rock formations that form natural wind walls. So you've got a high <laughs> perch that's protected from the weather. This is a cool photo. Um, on that side of the mountain and on the south side, depending on whether you're talking about sunrise or sunset, you're going to see a massive shadow, if the weather's good, of Shasta. So this is what it looks like at sunset from there. It's a 100-mile-long triangular-shaped shadow that goes across the land with the sunset. It's pretty awesome. Okay, next. Um, for, all, for this route, like many others, you need to do an alpine start. And it's important because you're going to need to climb 4,000 feet up. So around you know 500 feet per hour, you're going to deal with somewhat steep stuff, maybe some pretty icy snow. I need to be on the top before noon and back to your camp so you can have a late lunch in camp. <laughs> and then at the last day you'd hike out like you did like you do it on most routes. That's why it takes three days. One day up to a high camp, the next day weather permitting, attempt the summit and come back to high camp, and the last day you leave high camp and go back to trailhead and drive home. Okay, next. So moving around the mountain, there's a couple other technical routes. 
notes to put on looking at the sort of a shape of rock. And on the right hand side of it is what's called the right ice gully or the proper finish to the Hotham Glacier. And on the left of it is the left ice gully. And both of those, if you climb them from the bottom, require going to ice falls. So it's a pretty cool route. Um, we've climbed all of these routes in various teams over the years. So there's a couple links here that we don't have access to tonight, but you can go on to our YouTube channel and see what our ascent was like. <coughs> Here's the Hotland Glacier and the head wall. This is the head wall again. Um, the glacier with its various seracs and then the Bergschrund, which is right about here, which is the biggest crevasse on the mountain. This is the entrance to the left ice gully. So to get there, you're going to need to travel through the ice fall, go over the Bergschrund, and then rope up for snow and ice climbing up about 1,000 feet or so, moving through a couple rock bands, and then curving around to the ridge on that side. The head wall actually itself even has a 5-8 rock climb, which I probably will never do. <laughs> but it's there. <coughs> this is some pictures of the Hotton Glacier. Um, it is a really cool place. Um, it's got quite a few different um, really active serac areas. So um, it's fun to go there and look into the crevasses and make sure you don't <laughs> tiptoe your way around. And let's go through a couple more photos here, just to take a look at what they look like. Um, credits are at the bottom here. Um, so these are photos that have been captured by various visitors on the mountain. Um, pretty awesome place. The only place I've seen crevasses like this, there are other mountains, but the only place I've seen them to such extent would be on the glaciers on Mount Rainier. And Hood would be another place where there's some big stuff like this. Adams has got a few too, and Baker also, but boy, it's, uh, um, it's fun stuff. So this is the left eye scully information. It's Alpine Ice 3, which was steep, sustained ice climbing, especially <coughs> after July. Um, like I mentioned, it goes through three ice falls, and crossing this bear trend right here is the crux of the route. Venture over a snow bridge. Um, so you have to make sure that snow bridge is strong enough to support you, and probably need to be on belay with a good anchor in place, just in case yeah. you made a mistake in calculations. Yeah. But next. Um, this is what it looks like looking down the route from near where it turns the corner. And this would be typical sorts of conditions you'd find moving around the edge of the Bergschrund. <coughs> so, we'd always climb that one roped. Next. So finishing up, going around the mountain, um, we've got the Brewer Creek Trailhead, which is uh, one that requires about 20 miles of dirt roads. It gets you an access to a pretty scenic and often neglected side of the mountain where the Winton Glacier is, and another really uh, steep part of the mountain, the Kanwakaton Glacier and um, the Mud Creek area. So we'll talk about those coming up here next. <coughs> so between the Hotlam and the Winton is the Winton Ridge, just like the Hotlam Bolin Ridge and the Bolin Whitney Ridge, and this is a place where um, you can have the mountain to yourself especially if you come in from Brewer Creek. Um, as a ski mountaineer, that's probably the place you'd like to go. Um, I've seen a lot of skiers on it, and it's a three, well, 6,000? Yeah, 6,000 foot ascent, but definitely at least three or four, depending on the time of year. Um, and I would, I would recommend it. No crevasses, too. So that's about awesome. So like a double black diamond? No, no. <laughs> it's like a blue. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, it's cruiser. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so another moderate glacier climb, the Winton, and again, like I've said a couple times already, it's it's uncrowded, so it would be a great place to go. Here it is. Um, looking at um, the various features that are out there, there's a lot of cool little ridge lines and things you can take, and you can also go directly to the summit, so it's another fun way to, to get it. It's the final one. Um, it goes up a ridge just on the edge of the Kanwakaton um, and reaches the, reaches the summit area around Misery Hill. Um, the Kanwakaton is a really interesting glacier because it's super steep and crevassed, but it's really small. And that side of the mountains experienced a lot of erosion. They had a big mudslide there a couple years ago um, that really did some damage. And uh, this is an area that has the distinction of being 
you to make a deliberate journey to that part of the of the mountain and not <laughs> and not making a wrong turn as you come down the avalanche gulch route. There it is, the Kinwakaton. I'd like to go see it someday. I haven't haven't gotten that way yet. Um, it's very seldom climbed, but many rescues have been done here. So it's a pretty spectacular place, but pretty treacherous. All right. So a couple things, and this is uh, a lot of the, our, some of our standard stuff that we talk to people about when we discuss mountaineering is we're going to go through clothing and equipment, but very briefly, and any questions you have. But I've got some stuff laid out here on the table. So as we go through it, I'll try to highlight some items. For in terms of your clothing, you want to have thin, breathable layers that you can take on and off to match the conditions, whether they're sunny or windy or hot or cold or snowy. And that needs to be able to match all of the conditions you'd encounter. And that could be pretty wide ranging. You could experience about 40 to 50 degrees, potentially, in terms of temperature swing. So important to have at least two or three layers on your lower and upper body and multiple sets of hands and hand, head and hand wear and socks. <coughs> Set on. For the, the layering system, what we're looking at is the first layer would be base layer, so that's going to be thin, breathable. It's going to keep you warm and wicking <coughs> moisture. Then the medium layer is going to be insulating so that it can trap air there and keep you warm. And then the outer layer would be a, considered a shell, so it's waterproof, typically, and thin and windproof, probably with a hood. So here's a list of some of the things that would be very useful to have as you're going to go climb Shasta. I'd say um, we're looking at wool socks or synthetic that are fairly high, and then a pair of gaiters to match the junction between your pants and your boots. You have a question? There was a, a term on the previous slide right at the bottom. I've never... It's probably toque. Yes. Okay, toque is a word for a watch cap or a stocking cap or a toboggan oh. or a warm hat okay. or a ski hat. Or... Gotcha. All right. <laughs> so it depends on what part of the country you're from. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. That's more of a Canadian term. I call it a beanie. It's a, a beanie. Sock. That's another word for it, yes. It's a socks. Only two pairs? Minimum. Oh, pairs. okay. Well, it says two pairs. I was just saying. <laughs> that, that's pairs. minimum. Okay. Let's yeah. See. Bring more if you want. Oh, wish. yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Let's head on to the next one. Base layer. I have a I have a base layer here. Some of the stuff we pulled out for the last presentation. Looks like it's useful for this one, too. So, stretchy, long sleeve, venting, um, fairly thin. This would be an example of a base layer that would work pretty well. Also, you could layer a short sleeve shirt underneath it, which I like to do a lot because then your base layer can be really warm or not so warm, and you can mix and match. You can wear the short sleeve or the long sleeve or the short sleeve and the long sleeve. Kind of like the SMC shirt that you have on. That's right. Yeah. Kind of like this wonderful, wonderful. $15 SMC $15. wicking $15. shirt that I have with <laughs> that on the back. <laughs> so base layer is important. So spend good money on that. That's, a, that's key. And wool is a good fabric, too, to use, um, not just synthetics. Let's head to the next one. So a mid-layer, a lot of options here. It could be down, it could be synthetic, it could be soft shell or fleece. But I think of all the options, probably soft shell is the best. This is a jacket that our event leaders wear. It's an outdoor research for Rossi. It's stretchable, breathable, thin, and somewhat warm, fairly water-resistant mid-layer that you can also use as a jacket. So it's very versatile. <coughs> Same thing can be had for your pants. Get something that's soft shell and you'll be happy. For a shell jacket, we're looking for, for something that's waterproof from wind and is um, something that keeps you warm, too. Okay, so love your uh, harness if you're going to be wearing that. And it doesn't need to be very expensive, um, but you should leave it behind, so make sure it's packable and you can fit it in the bottom of your pack. You never know when the wind or the weather is going to change on Shasta. So here we are, the toque, with or without a tassel, depending on your preference, <laughs> or bravery. <laughs> and then this is a balaclava, so it covers 
your face, your head, and this important part of your body, which you can lose a lot of heat from the back of your neck. It also is a sun barrier. Okay, next. Glacier glasses, very important because your eyes can get sunburned, actually, and um, so make sure you've got one that uh, blocks 100% UV and <coughs> possibly photochromatic or polarized would be helpful, too, so you can see the variations in the snow. And then goggles would be would be uh, recommended. Do you recommend glasses and goggles, or can you just wear your goggles? So goggles will be <coughs> inconvenient to have many times. They'll be too hot and stuffy. Mm -hmm. So you can get <coughs> with it. You can get glasses that are wrapped. Um, most of them have side shields, so they function kind of like goggles, except for really heavy storms. And you wouldn't need to bring these all the time. This is mountaineering equipment that you should have at your disposal. If a storm's forecast, it's a good idea to have them. Next question. So, next slide. Um, so, hands. We're talking about uh, two types of gloves, probably, and a pair of mittens would be the preferred setup there. Light gloves, warmer gloves, and then warm mittens, if you can, or mitten shells that fit over the top. The puffy, and making sure that you've got something that, if it isn't at least uh, water, if it, it needs to be at least water resistant, if not waterproof. <laughs> so let's get ready. Let's, let's get our <laughs> <laughs> let, let's get our equipment together so we can get out there. Some other stuff we're going to need: <laughs> a right size climbing pack with a a good tent that it can stand up to the wind and the weather. A sleeping bag that's about 15 degrees or so. A powerful white gas stove or canister stove. Insulated water bottles because your water may freeze even in your pack on the ascent. Um, a pair of trekking poles for that heavy load. And then a shovel, altimeter, or a GPS for your party, depending on what sort of snow you're expecting to travel or camp in. Here's some ex recommendations from us about backpacks. Um, all of these first types are sold here in the store, and I just wanted to mention also um, that there's a 50% off sale going on at Bobcats here. So everyone who's here tonight, um, talk to Oliver about that. He'll tell you what's on sale. Typically, the backpack we're looking for for mountain climbing is going to be a maximum of 55 liters and probably a minimum of 30 liters in between these two, depending on how many days you're going to be out. So a single day would be 30, two days would be 40, and Three days would be a 50, generally speaking. And it's nice if it's got a floating top lid, fairly narrow with a removable waist belt, and can be expanded in size and stripped down when you're going to the summit, so you don't have to carry all that extra stuff with you. Sleeping mats and sleeping bags and pads. Again, this sleeping pad could be inflatable or it could be a, um, insulite type or both. Sometimes it's nice to have them both. And then whether it's down or synthetic for sleeping bags, I'd say you want something that's at least 30 degrees, probably 15 would be a nice compromise, like previously mentioned, between there and zero. All right, what's next? And then tents. A four season would be recommended, but if you have a three season that's got a full coverage rain fly or storm fly and you've had experience pitching it, then has completely disappeared because it was blown off the mountain with all of a person's gear inside of it, off Casabal Ridge, uh, for example. So you need to make sure that you do it right. It's got to be dug in, guy lines laid out, anchored in good, and it's strong enough to withstand snow and heavy winds up to 75 miles an hour. Yeah, Casabal Ridge, very windy. Yeah. Okay, new, new one. So here's a couple options for our stove. This is white gas. This is what we recommend for Shasta, but you need to learn how to prime it and use it. This is an MSR XGK that we use for expeditions, and this one has been on expeditions. Um, another one that is nice is the uh, a canister stove like the also MSR reactor. This has a special pot that fits on top of it. It's very efficient for melting snow. <coughs> so um, let's move on to the next one. In terms of food and water, what you want to take up there, um, it would be important to take stuff that you don't have to cook, so like dehydrated meals and squeezable items that have high energy in them, 
or possibly mix in carbohydrates, anything that doesn't require cleanup and can be eaten by just rehydrating water. Or you may want to go dry, depending on how you, what your propensity is. But something that is nice to have that's not a meal that's on there, but it should be on there, is a hot drink. That would be great to have, like cocoa or coffee or grandma's chicken soup or something. And then the other equipment that we'd like you to bring out there for Shasta would be things like a robust headlamp, an altimeter, um, or a watch and or a watch, a sharp knife, a collapsible water container, a fully featured compass, a set of maps, and some of the other items that are on here too would be useful. Um, for climbing gear on the mountain, it'd be important that you have if it's going to be a technical route, you may have to graduate sorry, from a mountain axe to an ice tool or something in between the two, depending on how steep your route is. And you may have to get into uh, ice climbing crampons and more specialized equipment, harnesses and protection so that you can protect the route and a rope. So some of the footwear that we'd recommend would be Double mountain and for somebody who's from five eight to six foot tall would would need a mountain axe about that size. All right, let's head on to the next slide, and then harnesses. This would be a nice harness for Shasta because it's lightweight and compact. Um, you don't really need a lot of padding, but it'll still do the job when you're tied into a rope team. You've got some gear loops, and it'll keep you safe in the event of a fall. The other things that you may need as we go to get into technical climbing on mountains like Shasta would be runners, wire gate carabiners, locking carabiners, a blade device, various pieces of cord like four millimeter loop for a prusik, or seven millimeter, 15 foot piece of cord for a cord of lead. And all of this technical equipment is available to club members. It's on loan on all of our official events. So you don't need to buy all this before you decide to go. You can come with us on an official event. We'll, we'll be able to loan you this stuff. So let's go on to the next one. And there's the carabiners and uh, pickets and things that we have available. They're not a whole lot of money, but um, it kind of adds up over time. <laughs> the list gets long. And some other items that we would use on Shasta would be like ice screws and possibly Rock Pro, depending on the rock quality. That would help us to anchor our ropes in and our teams in the event of a slip. We keep ourselves <coughs> safe. Let's move on. So that's about it, you guys, for, look at that, 901. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. Burn through that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you didn't ask any questions. We saved All right, here we go. Go ahead. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, recent conditions, especially for those who are going to join the hundreds of people doing Avalanche Gold yeah. this weekend? Uh, right now, I mean, I can speak from experience. There's a lot of new snow on the mountain right now, and the trailheads aren't as accessible, and the routes aren't going to look like you'd expect to be this close to June. They're going to be more like the end of March. And depending on what the weather is like, you could be in for a winter mountaineering experience rather than a summer snowshoes? mountaineering experience. Think it's snowshoes? I don't think snowshoes are going to be needed because okay. it's, it's going to firm up. For avalanche golf. But it's going to be a lot snowier than it normally would be this time of year. Uh, Steve? We actually climbed that a few weeks ago, and the snow there, pretty, pretty firm. <laughs> yeah. they got a new top layer of fresh snow, so yeah. there's not quite telling what that's going to do, but... So you may end up, yeah, you may end up with kind of a weird consolidated layer on top, and then bulletproof something underneath it. So you're going to need the, you need your compound sharp and to have your skills in play like usual. So, so yes? for Avalanche Gulch, uh, any point that you, <laughs> you need to rope off? No. No, not at all. So you, you will see guide <laughs> services roping up with clients, so, but so, nobody so, else does. So carrying a rope is extra weight then. Yeah. Yep. Uh, how much experience with crampons do you recommend um, 
Okay. Don't make it your first time on crampons. Okay. That's what I would say. <laughs> if you get at least one day in, um, that would be smart. The reason is, if you have a misstep or you don't understand how to use them, there's a possibility that you could start sliding. And if you don't know how to self-arrest, you will continue to slide. And you could hurt yourself pretty badly or other people, which is one of the reasons Avalanche Gulch is not so safe of a place for beginners because there's so many of those types of people there who have never used the gear before. So I think one of the major hazards is really other people who don't know how to um, really firm minor team with somebody who was already experienced descending that route. And they lost their footing and couldn't self-arrest and slid all the way to the bottom and had a huge road rash on their belly because all of their layers came up and were just sliding on ice. So, and I've seen people, the other times I've been there, I've been there three times and every time somebody's gotten hurt, either in my party or somebody else's. The other times I've seen people get hit in the face with rocks and ice that are coming off the red banks. I've seen broken noses and blood. And I've seen a lot of people who are climbing really weird technique and, and also glissading with crampons on and no, not knowing how to stop themselves. And that's been, that's the reason why they have a ranger at the bottom and they have the rangers on skis with first aid kits just waiting around for the next person to hurt themselves on Avalanche College. So, you've been question. there three times and every time you've gone, someone's gotten hurt? Yes, I've seen someone get hurt. Yeah, minor or, or somewhat major. Wow. Yeah. And I've nowhere else in the mountain, the other seven ascents that I've had on Shasta, I have ever seen an, an injury. So, <laughs> so it's not necessarily the difficulty of the route, but the people that are climbing it. That is yeah. the Steve, do you have a question? Just add one more little thing to that is above Red Banks, don't walk to the edge. There's a birch run to the top of the glacier, which is often covered by the snow drift. Yeah, can walk it. Close to the edge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can see it. So when you get to red rocks, you want to kind of stay away from the rocks themselves. Yeah. You, know, you don't want to get too close to them. Yeah. Because it sounds like another problem you were saying is the rocks can actually kind of come off there. And that can yeah, the rocks fall there. And then if that's not happening, there's rime ice that collects in the rocks. And because it's a south-facing route, they melt and start shaking. <laughs> so it's an exciting time. It's a good, safe distance. Of First, uh, well, the, the, the most important thing is the time of day you're climbing it. So I would be I would be above Red Banks before dawn to get yourself the best possible start. Also, you're going to beat most of the crowds. So get started about 2, maybe 3 a.m. Shed more rock after. Yeah, when the sun comes out and it warms up, that's when the rock and the snow starts shedding. And that's when most of the other people who haven't been there before will be climbing the slope. They probably won't leave their tent until maybe six, or maybe five or six. So I would I would get out the door at three. So for everybody who's been to these classes, <laughs> What's like that? the third person in one of these classes that have told us to leave at like two a.m. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Another question. Um, yeah. You mentioned Rock Pro. Have you found it on any piece of route that could use Rock Pro successfully? Just it. Yeah. Mhm. Mm Micro <laughs> cams, tri cams. Those are the best. Nuts don't work too well because it's really weird to have the right sort of shape. It starts because the rock is cracked. So we're talking about just little micro slinging boulders. We're here for that, but it's a 5A. <laughs> Typically, there's so much.